highest standard, uh, and it's never been better than this. Uh, an, an output as great as theirs must have employed many engravers, but this one is so good that I think it should probably be attributed to their chief engraver, a man called Walter Jackson. But although that might be the most impressive feature of the tray, the most interesting is that it is almost as elaborately engraved with a second coat of arms on the reverse. And the way it's displayed, when you go and see it, you can walk around, you can creep behind the showcase, and you can see that second coat of arms um, there. Um, this is really strange and deeply mysterious. Why would anybody do that? The answer, of course, is all to do with pride of ownership. Normally, one would put one's um, arms on the front where all the world could see them. But here, we assume that the royal arms were there already, so the back was the only place left. The owner of the arms was one, sorry with these names, William Arundel Harris Arundel. There we are, going in a little closer. And they're shown together with those of his wife, whose name was Lucinda Weber. But they didn't marry until 1815, so the tray must have been at least eight years old when this part of the engraving was done. Um, we don't know how Arundel got the tray, but it's quite possible that he bought it secondhand from Rundles, who would doubtless have charged a premium for the grand royal um, engraving. Actually, it doesn't quite end there, because um, as I was looking at it through the showcase yesterday, I noticed that there is a slight sort of rippling on the surface of that tray, which suggests to me it's not impossible that the royal arms were engraved, um, were the second coat of arms to be engraved on it. The first coat of arms was somebody else's, and it was then, as it were, given a retread. This sort of thing also happened from time to time. Um, Arundel came by his strangely pompous surname, Arundel Harris Arundel, because his grandfather had inherited the estate um, of a cousin by the name of John Harris, uh, but only if he changed his name and coat of arms to reflect the Harris connection. That was a condition of the inheritance. So plain Arundel became Arundel Harris Arundel, uh, and on the tray, the uh, Harris arms appear on the second and third quarters, as you can see there. Well, our man lived in a grand house uh, in Devon called Lifton Park. Um, and it was, as they say, uh, he was, as they say, a big cheese. Um, he was a magistrate, and in 1817, he was appointed High Sheriff of Cornwall, which was an important crown appointment. So perhaps it was to celebrate the royal connection that he uh, wanted the tray with the royal arms. Such um, self-promotion might seem almost ridiculous to modern eyes, but there's no doubt that Arundel Harris Arundel literally oozed pride, uh, even by the standards of his time. That is uh, certainly clear from an heraldic banner that he commissioned for his year as High Sheriff, uh, which shows his own arms allied with those of a whole series of other grand families uh, that he uh, claimed to be connected with. Um, his pride also comes across in a slightly more distasteful way in a story that was published in a newspaper in 1828 when he was still wielding power in the local judiciary. To cut a long story short, it described how Arundel, passing through his village on a horse, um, saw the road partly blocked by a local tradesman delivering a cartload of barley. Arundel was furious. Uh, with the man for being in his way, and fined him 10 shillings for obstructing the highway. When another tradesman interceded on his behalf, saying it was perfectly legal to stop while he delivered his merchandise, Arundel shifted into another gear and said, I am not to be taught the law by you, sir. I had only fined him 10 shillings, quite a sum of money, incidentally, for a poor tradesman in those days. I shall now fine him 20 shillings, and unless he pays it immediately, I shall commit him to the house of correction. In other words, send him to prison. Well, the whole thing went from bad to worse and resulted in the end in Arundel, I'm delighted to say, being officially censured for abuse of power. Um, it's amazing what windows into history can come out of a piece of silver. <laughs> well, I'd hate to end on such a low note, so let me finish instead with something 
completely different. Um, I said I'd come back to the, oh, well, there we are with, with, with the tray again. Um, here we are. Um, I said I would come back again to the seven dishes by George Wicks that we looked at earlier. They're very lovely, and they're in beautiful condition, but their real focus is the royal arms engraved in the center. The arms are, in fact, not those of the king in this case, George II at that date, but his eldest son, Frederick, Prince of Wales. And the Prince of Wales then, as now, has a different motto from the king, uh, Ich dien, I serve. And the arms have what is called a label for difference. Uh, this is the small tab-like motif on the upper part of the shield, um, which is the heraldic device that signifies the eldest son during the lifetime of the father. But in fact, the dishes were not made for the prince at all, but for the Earl of Scarborough, who was the prince's treasurer. And it so happens that George Wicks's business ledgers survive from um, that period, and we know that there were 11 dishes in all, and that the Earl was charged a total of 176 pounds, 10 shillings, and sixpence, plus a pound each for the engraving, and a further 87 pounds, one shilling, um, for the gilding. So you can see what an enormous amount gilding added to the cost of these objects. This is getting on for half as much again just to have them gilded. But it might seem rather strange, presumptuous even, that a servant of the prince should borrow, as it were, his royal master's arms for his own silver. But in fact, this seems to have been something of an accepted practice in the prince's household perhaps in the same way that his more humble servants would have worn his livery. But at least to, that's to say, a uniform with, with um, devices that pertain to his master. Um, but at least two other pieces share the same um, characteristic a as this, namely um, two solid gold cups of roughly the same date. These have finials, you'll notice, in the form of the Prince of Wales feathers, one, the one on the left, was made for Colonel Pelham, the uh, prince's private secretary, uh, and the other was made for Sidney Godolphin, who was his receiver general um, in Wales. And you'll notice we got the reference to the prince on the top, but the rather uh, punning reference to his surname, Godolphin, with the handles which are dolphins. Well... Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a, a huge pleasure to be with you um, today and to tell you something about these objects. Um, I was amused to read in an article about Sunnylands that appeared in the New York Times a little while ago that among the roll call of distinguished people who've stayed here in the past, uh, Queen Elizabeth II was a regular visitor. I'm not quite sure how many visits are necessary for before you count as a regular, but <laughs> I suspect this was a bit of journalistic hype. But I am delighted that um, the Prince of Wales, even if by token alone, uh, has at least taken up um, permanent residence here. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I say, it's been uh, a great pleasure to introduce some of these wonderful objects to you today. I hope you found my slightly unusual spin on them worth your patience. And I would just like to take this opportunity to pay tribute um, to the superb photography of Mark Davidson. Uh, who's really enabled us to get under the skin of these objects and made it possible for me to take the approach to my subject today that I have. Thank you very much. If there are questions in the audience, if some of you would like to ask them at this time, you're welcome to do that. Some others may be leaving. Um, and if we don't, and so I see a, a question right there. Rather than working directly with gold, you mean? 
Well, when, when one says money is no object, that's a slight exaggeration. Um, uh, of course, people were always, uh, people were always uh, wanting to get a certain amount of value for money, but they also wanted to make a bigger, grander display than the next person. Um, gold, of course, nowadays is per ounce vastly more expensive than silver. 100 pounds or 100 times or something more expensive than silver. In the 18th and early 19th century, the differential was about 10 times. But even so, that would mean a 100-pound tray would become a 1,000-pound tray. And, um, and anyway, um, there was the question of the amount of gold in supply. Because gold, don't forget, was money, was coinage as well. And I think if you wanted a substantial amount of gold, uh, you, you, you normally had to melt down some other gold object in order to produce the raw material to do it. So supply was one thing, but I think cost would have been another. Also, I would add, I personally think, and I'm not alone, that as I said at the beginning of the lecture, that actually the color of this beautiful, as we call fire gilt, mercurial gilding um, process is subtler and more beautiful than solid gold. You would have thought, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you would have thought. And in case those at the back didn't hear the question, it was um, you would have thought that modern technology would make it possible to do mercurial gilding safely. Well, I, I agree. But in, in England, it's illegal to do this process. In France, you can do it. But um, uh, So what people try to do nowadays is with various kinds of... Um, additives, um, they, they try to modify the color of the gilding, uh, but it never looks like the old stuff, sadly. Yes, ma'am. Food? Well, a lot of the gilded pieces that we have been looking at were actually made primarily for display. They weren't made for using. But as far as uh, silver that was used, and there was silver gilt that was used, of, of course William Beckford used his, his gold teapot. Um, it, it, they would use the same kind of cleaning materials that they used for, um, for silver, which in those days was pretty severe and pretty abrasive, actually. It was, um, they, they used um, um, ruby, um, jeweler's rouge, which was, was, was very, um, very abrasive. Um, but... Um, Paul de Lamery, one of the great goldsmiths from the middle of the 18th century, was asked once how he, his clients should clean their silver gilt, and he said with soap and water. I'll do that as, as briefly as I can. The, the question is, um, could I explain something about the whole process of, of commissioning an object and, and the production stages that it went through? Well, first of all, you, you've got two kinds of silver. You've got things that were made for stock, which were run-of-the-mill things, standard lines, and they would be made and they would be available and you could go into the shop and buy it. Uh, and then you might say you want to have it personalized with your, with your coat of arms and they would get that done for you. Um, if you wanted to commission a, an object you, uh, um, that was uh, bespoke and special to yourself, then you would go and see Mr. Rundle, and um, you would explain what you wanted, and they would get a design worked up, and you would look at that design on, on a piece of paper, and you might say that's fine, or you might request some modifications, um, and then it would be, um, and then it would move ahead from there, and moving ahead from there meant. Uh, if it was a complex piece with um, sculptural elements on it, then you'd have to make um, models um, and then molds and then cast them. And then the whole thing would be assembled together. These workshops had many people um, working in them and they were all highly, highly specialized. So when one says this piece was made by Paul Storr, 
Von Rady means it has his mark on it, and it was his factory that produced it. But within that factory, you had people that were raising the plain form uh, with big hammers working with that. You would have people who were, um, whose job was to solder parts together because that was a special skill. People whose job was to chase, um, put in the, the sort of chiseled ornament. Um, engravers would be different. The um, epern that we saw right at the beginning with all its pierced decoration, that piercing would be done by somebody who only did piercing, all he did. And so as a result, people got very, very quick at these things. Because then, as nowadays, nobody wanted to wait longer than they had to. Once they decided they wanted it, they wanted it. And um, so very often, the real challenge was to get it out quickly. Um, and one of these grand pieces, well, it, it depends. I, I told you that the big shield of Achilles was worked on for um, about 10 years, but that was totally exceptional. It wasn't something that had been ordered, and I suspect that Flaxman worked on it when he had, when he had some time on his hands. Um, it would be a matter of months, normally, for a, for a major commission, um, and if the goldsmiths couldn't deliver in time, then they would go out to the other goldsmiths and they would sub subcontract, so you'd get several workshops working on it to get, get it done quickly. Um, there were just one example, and then I'll stop. Um, I came across some documentation the other day about um, the representative of the Duke of, uh, um, the Elector of Saxony um, in London, and he wanted um, a toilet service for a royal wedding that was going to be in uh, a couple of months' time. And of course, then, as now, you know, nobody thought about these things until the last minute. So he was told to get one quickly. And he wrote back saying um, he can get this one, but it's going to take, it's going to take four months. Um, or he can get this one that they've got in stock already, and that, that's you know, available now. So they took the one that was in stock. <laughs> goes right back to um, right back to ancient Rome uh, and indeed sort of sixth century China very very far back very far back um, and there is a theory that that uh, Greek vases red figure vases black figure vases uh, they are in fact ersatz copies they're fake copies of vessels that have been made um, in silver or in gold um, and that the black figures and the red uh, and the red background that represents gilded surface and silver surface that had tarnished because it was fashionable to have an oxidized surface. So it goes right back as far as goldsmithing goes, really. Yeah, fountain. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very, very like it with that great rock work. Yeah, sure. Good, good, good point. Yes, good point. The one I'm thinking of is in Rome, right? Or oh, okay, well, that's right. Well, I don't know the I don't know all of the provenances, but I do know that that um, some of them um, came from auctions, high-profile auctions in London, and of course, Mr. Annenberg was uh, ambassador in London, and I think these things were acquired, some of them anyway, um, during his during his tenure of that office. But I believe he continued to collect later, but it would be through auctions or through dealers uh, in. Um, and you might have a better idea of that than me. Eight, eight candlesticks, for example. Mm. Any, any other questions? Sir? Uh, solid silver, yes. Solid silver. But you, you, you can gild, gild copper as well, and um, gilt copper things were often found. They're not normally of the same quality because the economics were different. The, the material was cheaper, the people wanted it because they didn't have the money to go for silver, and so they tended to be rather simpler things. Uh, 
Yeah, that's absolutely right. G gilded silver uh, tarnishes, it does tarnish, but much more slowly than silver, which, tends to, which means that, that um, gilt objects tend, of, of that sort of age or earlier, they tend to be in better state than silver objects because they haven't had to be cleaned too often. Uh, the V&A and the British Museum have both got large collections of um, designs for objects, but um, the working drawings, which is what would have been used in the workshop for these things, they, of course, one imagines, just, just got gradually uh, um, damaged and, and torn and coffee stains on them and so on, and um, so they, they tend not, not to survive. But there must have been detailed, rather like detailed architect's drawings for these things. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, the, I mean, the, there's a vast collection of ornament drawings in the in the V&A. Absolutely huge. 